let's go ahead and introduce our first guest who's already standing right next to me, Mr. Donnie Cates. How's it going, Donnie? It's going great, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for kicking off uh, day two. You were one of our first uh, guest announcements for Mainframe, and we, I mean, you, you set the the snowball rolling down the hill that, 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 that built what Mainframe became this time. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's an honor. I appreciate that, man. You got it. Where, where, where are you remoting in from? You down in Texas right now? Yeah, I'm in Austin, Texas. Uh, it is uh, unbelievably hot outside, uh, so much so that my little dog burnt her paws and is now in a cone. Oh, uh, she may be making an appearance later on. Oh, the poor puppy. Yeah, poor puppy. she's not into it. Well, it's a beautiful day here in uh, Chicago, the Windy City. Hardly any riots going on today. So that's always a good thing. Sure. Uh, here in Chicago, guys, the uh, the chat room is already blowing up with people asking their questions about uh, all of your Marvel work, all your current stuff, the stuff that everybody wants to hear about. Guys, keep those questions coming in the comments section, but uh, we're going to get to those in just uh, maybe a few minutes. Before we get into that, I want to kind of get to know you, Donnie, just a little bit. You and I have actually... Uh, not really spoken. We've met each mm -hmm. other at cons before. I'm sure you don't remember, but I'll uh, remind you a little bit later on <laughs> in the show. But I want to kind of wind the clock back just a little bit and sort of do a little get to know you. I'm going to try not to make this sound like an episode of Inside the Actors Studio sure. or uh, VH1 Behind the Music, but I want to kind of get uh, fans caught up on your whole work, your body of work, your history, even going back before uh, your work in comics. I mean, was writing young Donny Cates, little Donny Darko, I mean, was this was writing always something that was really big uh, in uh, your history? Have you Did you write in high school? No. Anything like that? No, not at all. I, I actually, I grew up as, a, as an artist. I grew up doing um, like sculptures and, and wanting to kind of be a penciler for comics. Um, and then I <clears throat> kind of fell backwards into running a, a chain of comic book stores here in Austin. Um, and then when I ran those into the ground, um, I still wanted to be in the comic book industry, so I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, where I tried to be a penciler. Um, and I ended up in classes with uh, Jeff Shaw and Trad Moore, um, who I would continue to work with for the next like 10 years of my life. And this was, yeah, this is around like 2009, 2010. And um, at Savannah College of Art and Design, you can get like a, an actual accredited degree in sequential art, which is comics, right? And uh, even though I wanted to be a, a, a penciler, I, I, they kind of make you take all the classes. Um, and so I ended up taking a writing class and my writing professor kind of took me aside and said, hey, you could be good at this if you tried. Um, give me one second. Hey, babe. Sorry, I know this is this is a live show. Hey, can you make sure this is plugged in because I'm losing power over here? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's hi, Megan. Just, How's it going, mm -hmm. Megan? <laughs> Everyone says hi, babe. Megan's uh, going to be on the show in Hall D a little bit later on today. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, um, I I bounced from that right to um, I took like a summer off um, from school and and it, is it not working? Mm -mm. Oh, that's weird. Um, yeah, my battery's about to die on my computer. That's great. Um, even though it's even though it's very clearly plugged in. Um, um, yeah, and so uh, we'll just keep talking until this dies or not. Oh wait, there it goes. There it goes. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and so yeah, I hadn't really written a word in my life until about two thousand nine, and then I took uh, I, I I was at Savannah for like two years straight, like summers and everything. And then um, took one summer off uh, just to go back home and see my family. And in that summer, I got picked to be an intern at Marvel, um, an editorial intern. And so I moved to New York and did that for the better part of a year. And then immediately got out and started trying to make my own comics. Um, and I self-published them. I made like ash cans and went to comic cons and tried to put them in people's hands. And I was probably the most obnoxious person in the world at cons. I was that guy just like hunting down editors and stuff. Um, but it uh, it paid off. Um, and here I am. How'd the internship happen? I mean, how does that, uh, like, how exactly does one go about getting an internship at Marvel? Uh, There's a portal on their site. I mean, well, it's different now. Um, <clears throat> I can't really speak to the process now, but in 2009, uh, it was an unpaid internship and you had to fill out a form online on Marvel's site and then write a, a letter. You, you had to be enrolled in college uh, to get, um, you know, college uh, uh, accreditation, you know. Um, and I wrote, I, what, I, what I found out was that editors 
uh, most of the time don't pick their own interns. The intern who's leaving picks their own replacement. And so knowing that, but because a couple a couple of people in my in my um, class and stuff had done it, and so knowing that, I wrote um, a letter that was kind of skewed towards someone my own age, as, as opposed to it. Kind of took a lot, a lot of the pressure off of like thinking that like Tom Brevoort was going to read something that I wrote, you know. Um, and so yeah, I I got kind of randomly picked out of the pile. Um, very luckily for me, I had just gotten, um, I had just, um, been, uh, you know, I, I ran like four comic book stores here in Austin. Those closed down. I moved to Savannah and I got a, a job at a comic book shop there. So I read literally every comic book that came out every week. And so, uh, like Marvel, DC, Image, Dark Horse, whatever it was, I read it. Um, and so when I went in for my interview at Marvel, they were like, so what Marvel books do you read? And I was like, all of them. And they're like, don't don't try to impress us. Just just like, what do you read? I was like, no, I literally read all of them. And then they gave me a quiz, and it was like ten editors in a room, and they were like, which book do I do? And I was like, oh, you do Ultimate Spider Man, and in Ultimate Spider Man right now, uh, you know, Ben Disney and Badly just introduced the Chameleon Twins, and this 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 and that, and and like and like as I started going down the row, I could see them all trying to like start to like exchange looks of like. Jesus, kid, like this kid's insane. This like, kid's how gonna to, take like, our job. Man. This, this, <laughs> why? How does this kid have this much time on his hands? Um, and yeah, I, I ended up as an editorial intern uh, under Jordan White, Mark Canicia, and Sana Amonet, um, uh, who I would end up working with almost all of them. In fact, um, Thanos wins. The first real book that I did for Marvel was uh, edited by Jordan. And Jordan really, really, really fought hard to get me in the door there because um, he he had followed me. Actually, a lot of the editors had been following me since I started getting uh, books put out, you know, but it wasn't really until God Country, like my 10th creator own book, where uh, Axel Alonso got his hand on it and uh, uh, thought that it was that I, I, I was you know, at least showing potential enough to be able to come in and, and handle something. And what's weird is they kind of, it was very, um, it was very uh, a fortunate time for me because they gave me my first assignment at Marvel. And I know you want to go back and we, and we will, but um, um, at the time they gave me, uh, you know, they didn't start me out on like what they considered to be like a super A-list book. They started me out on the second half of Jeff Lemire's run of Thanos, right? And so yeah. I start I started on issue thirteen, um, but it just so happened that during the course of the six months that I was on Thanos, Thanos became a household name. This book right here, that book right this there, gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous book. And so it went from like almost overnight to me trying to explain to my parents that I got a job at Marvel, and they're like, "Oh my God, who are you? What 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 book?" And I was like, "Thanos," and they were like, "Who?" <laughs> what is what is Thanos? And like overnight, like Thanos is a household name. He's on like McDonald's cups and shoes and backpacks and stuff. And it just like it was the perfect timing, you know. Wow, that's like your whole life story in one long, one long run on uh, sentence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if you've read my writing, you know I I'm fond of those. I hate periods and commas. I want to talk a little bit about um, like in 2014 when books like uh, you talked about Jeff Shaw, you know, working with Buzzkill. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Shaw became like, you know, your your lifelong uh, work partner, books like The Paybacks and uh, Ghost Fleet. Yeah. A killer, killer book, Ghost Fleet. So I know you worked, uh, did the internship at Marvel and stuff, but when these books came out and they started hitting shelves, I mean, where were you at sort of, where was your mindset at uh, when these sort of indie books sort of hit the shelves? Kind of your first real, and correct me if I'm wrong, but some of your first real work out on paper. I mean, did you feel like, okay, I've made it at this point. I've, I've reached the mountaintop. You know, I've got these three books in comic shops. This is it. This is as good as it gets. Or did you? Did you no, it was abject failure uh, from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> Buzzkill was supposed to be a 12 issue series um, that was going to follow uh, the 12 steps of, you know, um, uh, getting clean. And then yeah, because I was no one at the time and, you know, no one's going to give me a 12 issue series right out of the bat. They shortened it to four. And so it was a real tough time you know, uh, cramming buzzkill into four issues. I like to think that Jeff and I uh, did a good job on it. But then, um, and, and and yeah, buzzkill got a lot of heat right off the bat. And so I, uh, I was I was working in a sandwich shop here in Austin. And when buzzkill number one came out, I 
immediately quit my day job thinking like, oh, this is going to be great forever now. Flash forward to Paybacks and uh, Ghost Fleet coming out. I'm working at Best Buy. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, and then both of those series were, I think Ghost Fleet was supposed to be 12 issues and Paybacks was supposed to be an ongoing and they were both canceled within about four issues. And then we had to wrap things up really quick. Um, and so after the Dark Horse, um, my kind of my stint at Dark Horse, uh, I for real thought it was over. I really, really, really thought that 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 was it, you know. Um, and then I went to Heavy Metal and finished the paybacks and did a couple other books over there, uh, some short stories in the magazine. And then <clears throat> out of nowhere, um, like every book I've ever pitched, if it's ended up at Dark Horse or Heavy Metal or IDW or anything like that, um, it was always pitched to a wide variety of publishers and Dark Horse was just the one that, that bit, right? Um, but it all, it was always pitched to Eric Stevenson and um, Image Comics, right? Um, and then I came up with two new ideas and sent them over to Eric Stevenson. And within about 20 minutes, I was at work and I got an email back from Eric saying, yeah, like, yeah, let's do that one. And that one was God Country. Uh, Let, let's talk about God Country. I mean, sure. oh my God, the book that really, I mean, made yeah. Donny Cates a household name. You know, I read one time <laughs> in an article, um, I want to talk about, you know, sort of the, the, the inspiration for that book, but I don't know if you said this or if somebody else said this, uh, but they said, what if Thor's hammer landed in a trailer park? Yeah, that was kind of the, so it, it, God Country is actually an idea that I had had uh, beginning in like 2007, like a long, long, long time ago, before I even had any idea that I would ever actually become a, a writer. I just, I played around with the idea of, wouldn't that be hilarious if, if Thor's hammer landed in like a trailer park and some redneck piece of shit like picked it up and you know hilarity ensues and that's just what it was it was supposed to be like a comedy kind of like a, a next wave over the top kind of just bananas kind of a thing and then i couldn't really get to the bottom of it i couldn't really figure the story out and so i just shelved it and then um uh, a while back like um i don't know about a uh, about less than a year before the book came out i had a pretty traumatic um uh health scare that landed me in the hospital and i kind of kind of sort of almost died from it. Um, and then when I got out of the hospital at the uh, ripe old age of 30, like I turned 30, my body just completely, completely shut down on me. Um, I I got out and I suddenly had things to say about um, death and how to let go and what you leave behind when you go. Um, it really was the beginning of me. Like you can go back and you can read Buzzkill and obviously there's a, there's a, a message to that book. And but then after that, I just started kind of writing uh, like popcorn books. Like The Paybacks is an out and out comedy, which I adore. I love that book. And Ghostly as well, because I got to work with Daniel Warren Johnson, which is his his, his first uh, published work. Um, and obviously he's gone on to be, you know, a fucking superstar. Um, and um, I, I had an immense amount of fun on both those books. But like The Paybacks was an out and out comedy. And Ghost Fleet was really me just trying to do my best John Carpenter impersonation. Um, and then, I, but I, you know, they, they didn't really have a whole lot of, like, of, of, of things to say, you know, um, and then God Country came around, and then shortly after God Country, like, within the next three to four months, I dropped God Country, Redneck, and Baby Teeth all within the span of, like, three or four months, and they were all directly informed by my own history and my own past, and I, I, I started kind of delving deep into my own history and writing about things that I felt like I genuinely had a, uh, a voice in, namely with, especially with God Country and Redneck, um, an authentic um, point of view of a Texan that has had um, history in both West and East Texas and could kind of speak to, um, uh, kind of, I, I tend to lean a lot towards like family stories, especially in my in independent work. Well, also in like Venom and stuff like that. I, it's a, It's a thing that's kind of, um, they, I'm always kind of drawn to, but yeah, I think that it really was because I finally had something to say with a, a piece of work that God country connected, uh, with so many folks. It was yeah. a, it was crazy. It was a wild time.
I mean, w my, my wife and I absolutely love Dodd Country. Quick story as we go into uh, one of your next books. I mean, you, you did mention uh, Redneck, which is absolutely killer. We could talk about that book for an hour. But um, we we actually met you. We were at uh, C2E2 about maybe, I don't know, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was before Donny Cates was like, you know, John Lennon level uh, uh, presence at, <laughs> at a Comic-Con. But we just caught up with you when you were at the Aftershock. Uh, table you were, oh, sure. you were at and we went up there to kind of talk to you about god country maybe get a signature and stuff and you were super cool but you gave us this awesome little black and white uh oh, the little copy. preview yeah, you yeah. Were like this little preview you're like all right this is this is something i'm working on i think you're really gonna dig it and it's so awesome because I, I feel real special that we were like one of the first people who got to read uh your book baby teeth and it's a really neat little preview it's all black and white it's not colored and stuff and then when that book came out, it was just insane. Yeah. So good, man. I love the story of Baby Teeth. It's very much deals in family. There's yeah. some wonderful humor in it. Uh, what can you tell people about sort of the inspiration for Baby Teeth? I know it was a pretty personal project. Well, yeah. I mean, it was it was kind of, again, right on the heels of, of when I, uh, after my hospitalization and stuff, um, like right in the same time that I almost died, my brother gave birth to his to his first and only child, um, and so like in the on the cusp of me almost dying, this like horrible thing, there was this beautiful newborn baby, which is just the symbol of hope and future and all these beautiful things. And so I started thinking about it, and um, uh, for whatever reason, through the lens of my mind that story ended up being about a, a mom desperately trying to raise her son uh, who is the antichrist um but see that it's a, it, the thing is it is also kind of informed um you know every story of like evil kids and like the antichrist or the omen or like rosemary's baby and stuff like that um the mom is always terrified of the kid and and is always uh somewhat of the um the victim in the story because a lot of those stories prey upon the the fear of just of giving birth in general and it kind of plays upon like how how scary of a thing that can be right um and i didn't want to tell that story i wanted to tell the story of uh of kind of my mom uh who who had me and um my brother very very uh, very very young um and god country was such a masculine story and was about fathers and sons and you know grit and blood and shit that I kind of wanted to see if I could tell the opposite story, a very feminine story, um, a very, um, uh, a very hopeful story. Um, you know, it's a, it's about, you know, a single parent who doesn't care what the world says about her kid and is, is and, 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 and kind of looks at the world and the world is saying your kid is evil and your kid's going to, you know, destroy this and do this. And she says, I don't give a shit. It's my yeah. kid. Like you're not going to touch my kid, and it's um, I've, I've actually finished writing it now. Uh, I'm done with it. Uh, it'll start coming out again soon. I was going to um, ask you about that. It, it's yeah, been off shelves for a little while. It We're has. eagerly waiting. It'll be out soon. Uh, we just got the last few pages of a new issue in uh, the, the other day, so it'll be back out. It'll be 20 issues total, um, and uh, I'm very proud of it. Um, you know, Sadie, uh, the main character, is um, in the Bible that I wrote for the book. Um, I wanted a I wanted a main character that that would solve problems uh, uh, kind of in an unconventional way from for comic books. Sadie Sadie never throws a punch. Sadie never picks up a gun. She never does anything. She 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 literally saves the world just by being a phenomenal mom and taking care of her son and protecting her son from all these things that everyone says that they're going to be. Um, and so it was a, it was a, a wonderful book and I'm incredibly proud of it. Um, and the reception to it was, was, was insane. You know, yeah, you, you talk about family. I mean, that's one of the things I like about it. Cause you know, it's, it's multi-level you Sadie just, you know, surrounds, uh, her son with so much love and protection, but yet Sadie's family surrounds Sadie with so much love and protection. Right. Exactly. It's this big, just, just massive family thing. Also, I love the humor in it. Um, yeah. like uh, Satan, went, that I think there was one scene, uh, where the devil is, uh, like he's making dinner and he starts grabbing all these cats. Yeah. He's like, what? what? You're not hungry. Uh, that uh, does nobody else <laughs> yeah. want to eat anything. I mean, it's, yeah, he's just cooking, he's just cooking cats in a pot. Yeah. Yeah. And he's super casual about it. Yeah. True, true story. The, uh, so the, the devil in, in baby teeth, 
um, has this thing where he appears, it appears um, as whatever your either your greatest fear is or something you're sexually attracted to is. Um, and so for like Mike, their dad, it looks like a, like a, like a biblical Satan, uh, for Heather, it doesn't look like anything at all because she's asexual and she's not afraid of anything. Um, and for Sadie, uh, he looks just like Gerard way. Yeah, he does. (laughs) Yeah, that that was, that was the point. And actually, if you go back and you look at the early, early issues, she has like, um, uh, my Kim posters on her wall and stuff. Uh, Sadie's actually the closest character I've written to me. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I'm actually a 16 year old girl inside. Uh, so it was, it's pretty natural. Well, you know, I mean, the chat board's blown up, guys. I promise we're going to get to your questions. Um, so go ahead and start getting them in. Uh, for Donnie, I'm going to let you guys kind of field all the Marvel questions, but just uh, one more thing that I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, I think it was last year we saw. Uh, the news break that God Country was potentially it was being picked up and optioned as a film. Is anything mm-hmm. uh, happening there? Is any movement yeah. happening? Uh, yes, and I, but I can't tell you. Um, Damn it. Uh, it! It is moving along um, uh, very well. I, I, um, I, I wrote the screenplay for it, um, which was a blast. Uh, I had never kind of adapted any of my own work. It was weird, uh, you know. When writing God Country, I won't spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it, but there's a thing that happens in the third act that unless you're a robot, you're going to cry at. Um, and uh, I I tend to get like super invested in my characters when I write when I write books to the point w- where if I'm if I have to write a death or if I have to write a, a a horrible thing or even like a very happy emotional thing it's not uncommon uh for meg and my wife to walk up to my studio and see me crying as i'm writing and she's just like oh no what happened and i'm like just do this uh it's she's like, this is gonna be so good i know it is though <laughs> and so um yeah writing god country the first time was really hard and then uh, somewhat harder uh, writing the screenplay because I had to kind of relive and kind of get my head back into that space. Um, but it's cool. Writing a screen screenplay is really fun. Um, you know, uh, you can kind of write in 4D. You can use like sounds and light in a way that you can't in comics. And, um, you know, my heart will forever be in comics. Uh, I'm not about to bail and go, you know, write a bunch of movies i mean unless i'm asked to i don't know man. Um, can back up that money truck and uh, you could be I mean, I'm not, movie man i mean i'm not saying I, I i will continue to do both i'll say that um but uh but yeah the, the 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 film is coming along uh very well we have um uh cool people signed on to it uh right. so uh announcements to come uh decently soon i would imagine do you think we'll get any announcements in, tw- in 2020 or uh man honestly i don't know if it, it, it's 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 so odd uh i hesitate to even say anything because movie things are always there's a lot of moving pieces and i don't want to i don't want to jump the gun on anything but, well, but 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 things have happened to progress it that is good news Close. i know a lot of times these things can just kind of get picked up and then go nowhere but right. i want to go ahead i feel like i've bogarted the conversation quite long enough and there's a lot of people in the comment section drew man true a uh, uh, fellow mainframer asks, uh, with your obvious comic uh, fandom, what are the big tropes and comic book touchstones that you plan to explore in your new book, Crossover? Yeah, well, um, obviously, uh, you know, the premise of Crossover is that um, what if one of these big Marvel or DC summer events, these big, huge, galactic spanning things, what if it uh, got so big that it collapsed into our very real world? In a world where, like, Robert Downey Jr. plays Iron Man, like, all of a sudden, Iron Man falls out of the sky. And, and it, 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 it's, it's somewhat like the show The Leftovers in, in so much as um, it follows kind of regular, everyday people as they kind of deal with what the world looks like now in a world where uh, fiction is reality and reality is kind of dead. Like it changes the landscape of everything and they kind of get um, swallowed up in this kind of grand conspiracy thing of trying to trying to figure out how it happened and trying to kind of, uh, um, 
they kind of go down the, down the rabbit hole in a very fun way. But, but, but honestly, the impetus of it is um, I kind of wanted to create a book that felt like early image stuff that was just like balls to the walls, crazy. You never knew what to expect. Like in in, in any given issue of Young Blood or Spawn, yeah. like like Savage Dragon could just be there all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they would just they had this interconnected image world um, that we've kind of gotten away from, right? Um, and so it's taken Jeff and I like three years to kind of um, put all the pieces together and get um, permissions from people to do things. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really fun book. It's, it's not, um, it's not as, uh, it's not as like, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that it's without its consequences and its, and its, and its depth, but it is very much in the spirit of like early nineties image books that are just like bombastic and insane. And you never know, like anything feels possible. Yeah. You know, at any turn of the page, it, 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 I like to think it, at least that, um, we're going to keep you on your, on your heels. It's a bit of a puzzle box book. So, um, you know, it's kind of a long form storytelling thing. So we'll bring things up that, I mean, again, that's, I, I, I like reread a lot of Wildcats and, and, and Youngblood and Spawn. And what I love about it is the, the confidence that those guys had where, you know, in Wildcats, they would bring up, there'd be like a two page, uh, scene that set up some plot point that wouldn't get paid off until issue 26. And you, you're you reading it and you're like, man, did Jim Lee forget about this plot point with like Dan Quayle? And then like, and then like, sure enough, like 20, 20 issues later, it's like, oh shit, no, he knew exactly what, what, what he was doing. He was just confident enough that this was going to keep on going forever. And they were right, right? Um, so I wanted to make something like that that really felt like it existed both in our world, but also in that world that um, for people around my age, maybe a little bit younger, maybe a little bit older, um, you know, that felt like that early image explosion in the, in the early nineties, you know, um, and hopefully we pull it off. It's a crazy book. Um, so we'll see. I'm sure it's going to freaking crush. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> speak, speaking of character crossovers and, and, and all that kind of thing. I mean, we got a great question here, uh, from, what was it? ML Bishop 28 said, I would love to know. Uh, if you were given a choice of a DC, uh, a choice choice of DC, and you took it, what character would you like to take on? Um, I have a few. Um, uh, I mean, Batman, obviously. That's that's what you say, right? Um, and I do have like in my in my um, in my back pocket, I do have like a five year Batman plan. Um, some of it doesn't really work anymore, um, uh, but a lot of it. Uh, I think it'd be really rad. Um, I would also really like to get a crack at Constantine. Um, uh, I have a great, I, I, I actually, as a matter of fact, I got um, hired at DC before my exclusive at Marvel um, uh, went into effect. Um, DC wanted me to write um, uh, Constantine and I had turned in an entire outline and um, it was insane. It was really, really crazy. Uh, I would tell you, except for the fact that uh, hopefully someday I get to do it. Um, and then right as as that happened, um, uh, Marvel came and offered me an exclusive. And so I had to politely turn that down. Um, but over the years, you know, D DC and I have stayed in, in contact. And, and every time my Marvel exclusive contract comes up for you know, uh, re-signing, they somehow always know when that is. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously I, I would, I would, uh, you know, it's nothing against my family at Marvel who I love dearly, but, uh, 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 in my time on this earth, I would really like to play with Batman and Superman and, and, and all the toys. I would really, honestly, if I had a, if I had a dream job over there, I would relaunch the, the, uh, the authority. Wow. I think I could do some really fun stuff with the authority. We asked a similar question to uh, Kevin Smith last time. And he said, the question. The oh, question. I, had a, I actually had a pitch for the question as well. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting question here from uh, Koi Jandro, who's actually going to be hosting the Tom Taylor interview right after this. Hi, one Koi. Hi. Uh, he said, what's the best soundtrack to prep for The King in Black? Oh, probably like funeral tunes. <laughs> awesome. Um, 
anything that'll help you uh, maintain happiness through um, the horrific things that I do to all your favorite characters and King in Black. Uh, Hama, how is it? Am I that? Hamez says, do you plan on doing any long-term Marvel runs after Thor and Venom, or would you rather switch focus to uh, long-term creator-owned stuff? Uh, no, I, I, I have... Um, so my current contract with Marvel goes up until 2023, um, and I have very long plans uh, that take me all the way through that. Um, we will see... What that what that looks like after 2023, but um, I'm a, I'll be on Thor for a really long time. I've been on Venom for a really long time. Um, I will remain on both of those books. Um, I'm writing the, the King in Black right now, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and I know what my next two assignments are after after Venom are. Um, and then Thor is yeah, Thor's Thor's Thor's. If you've been reading my Thor run, you know that oh, yeah. we're that we're obviously gearing up for for something big. Um, and when you read issue six, Thor number six, which I believe is out next week, uh, you'll begin to kind of see the shape of 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 just how big that's going to be. So yeah, I'm not going anywhere, guys. I want to go back to Bradley Tan's question. It was a really good when he said, uh, uh, "What was your most memorable story pitch, and how did the people in the room react to it?" Baby teeth. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, if you talk about pitching something in the room, that would be a Marvel thing. I remember when I got, um, when I, uh, when I was handed the Inhumans, um, and basically I was told, um, my only kind of edict for the book was you can do whatever you want. See, okay, let me just address one thing really quick. Everyone thinks that there was some sort of an edict from Marvel that we needed to kill the Inhumans because of the whole Fox thing. That's so unbelievably untrue. Um, what actually happened was I was told, look, it was after the success of Thanos and Doctor Strange, and um, those two books um, started getting to keep people kind of uh, talking and excited about my books. And so they said, we want you to do an Inhumans book and the deal is you can do anything you want as long as you get people talking about the Inhumans. And I was like, well, um, I, can, I can do that. Um, it's going to require a, but, a pretty mass uh, genocide. Yeah, I might, have to, I might have to drop some bodies. So I went into the, to the creator summit uh, that we had that, that year. And I kind of... Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I told them that I was like, you know, a lot of inhuman stories are about like politics and, and, you know, like chess playing and all these things and about like monarchs that are, you know, a little bit like stoic and like the two best characters in the inhumans don't speak, you know, like the dog and black bolt. Right. Mm -hmm. I know his name's Lockjaw. I call him the dog. Um, and so I, I told them like, as a fan, it was always kind of difficult for me to be able to, um, to, to get into like the human element of it. Um, and so I said, what I want to really do with death, death, with the Inhumans, it, it wasn't called death of the Inhumans at the time. It was just going to be called the Inhumans. Um, I said, I want to do something really, really, really simple. I want to do like a straight up, like machine guns and monster trucks revenge story, um, and so I kind of want to do John Wick in space and I just kind of like backed up and let that sink in to everybody. And it was Dan Slott who figured out what John Wick in space for the Inhumans would, would, <laughs> would mean. And Dan starts yelling at me from across the room. He's like, you are not going to kill Lockjaw. You are <laughs> not going to kill Lockjaw. And I was like, Hey man, I'm going to kill Lockjaw. Lockjaw's sure. dead, man. He's dead, baby. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I told him, I was like, you guys want me to get people talking about the Inhumans, right? I got to kill a dog. You yeah, know? I mean, you know, how, how pissed off was Charles Soule uh, when, who spent so much, so many years trying to uh, reenact, the, you know, bring the Inhumans back to life with so many runs for so many years. And then here comes Donnie. Well, the only, you I mean. You get on I, a block I, I, and I, you're going to wipe him out. Well, I mean, it's, it's generally considered... <laughs> Kind of par for the course that some young punk is going to come in and and with a scythe and 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 literally cut, 
cut all your <laughs> cornfields down. I mean, I, I I fully expect that when my venom tenure is over, that that some young kid's going to come in there and be like, it was all a dream. There is no null. There is no God of the symbiotes. And that's fine. Um, the thing is, I think people assume that we as writers at Marvel um, take that kind of thing personally, you know, um, but it really is just, it's, the thing is you can't get rid of Charles Soule's run unless you invent time travel. It's still there. Right. So I didn't, I didn't undo anything that Charles did. It's still there. And, and Charles and I are buddies and um, Charles is actually very helpful during um, um, in the room, kind of uh, helping me kind of wrap my head around the Inhumans because it, it, it actually wasn't, a book that I grew up reading. I, I read like the Marvel Knight stuff, right? Um, but I, it was uh, Charles was was super helpful in, in kind of helping me flesh certain parts of it out. Yeah, uh, Drew Manchu goes on to talk a little bit about the, the death of the humans. Uh, loves it, by the way. Is there any chance of uh, more Inhuman stuff coming from you? Uh, from me, I, I'm I, my dance card's a little booked for the time being, um, but. Um, uh, my lips are sealed as to what Marvel might have planned for those for those fellas. Which means I mean, they, would, they wouldn't be sealed if there was nothing in them, right? I mean, there's got to be something behind those lips. Okay, we won't go there. Or I just don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm just or, making stuff up. Or you're just talking it's shit, super, completely super blowing stuff out of your ass. <laughs> uh, Mike Rogers does uh, more Death of the Inhumans. Does the Death of the Inhumans uh, tie Black into uh, the Venom Thor story arc? Um, No. <laughs> um, uh, Kelly Thompson's done a great job of picking up some of those threads uh, and doing it in Captain Marvel uh, the, with the character of Vox and now Vox Supreme. Uh, so definitely it's carried over there. Um, and I think um, I would be surprised if some of, uh, of, of Kelly's stuff ends up um, kind of interweaving with the King and Black event. I'll say that. Okay, I mean, I know your dance card's full, but uh, Brandon uh, Bloxdorf says with Marvel working on uh, Miracle Man again, uh, would you be up to uh, I, contributing to that? I would literally drop everything I'm doing. Uh, yeah. Miracle Man is my favorite comic book of all time. Um, it's one of my favorite characters of all time. Um, the only problem with taking that assignment is, um, you remember that time I took over Thor uh, from the guy who wrote the most issues of Thor of all time <laughs> and arguably wrote one of the greatest stories besides Walter Simonson? Who literally uh, put himself on the cover of the final uh, yeah, final issue. Yeah. Like, it was well, that good. That was terrifying. Following Jason on Thor was absolutely terrifying, uh, almost paralyzing to, to step into those shoes, to step into that book. And with Miracle Man, you're stepping into Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman. And then if it was me, it'd be like Johnny Alan Cates. Moore, Neil Gaiman, Johnny Cates. And then, the you know, Ghost whoever, Fleet guy. Yeah, yeah. I, man, I mean, I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a scary, it's a scary thing to jump on. Um, but I mean, I would take it if they offered it to me for sure. It was one of those things where I think everyone at Marvel knows that there's two properties that, if they ever get like their hand on them, if they ever get like the license for them or anything, uh, much in the same way that when we all found out that uh, Marvel was getting uh, Conan, uh, we all collectively agreed, let's get out of Jason's way. Oh my God, uh, that was uh, so like, good. Literally, yeah. literally no writer at Marvel asked if they could write it because we all knew like Jason Aaron will murder us. Like he's the biggest Conan fan in the world. If you go to his house, his office. I didn't even is just, know that. Like, oh my god! If you go to his house, his office is just like covered in all the books and like every all the all the old magazines and everything. No he's shit. a huge he's a huge nut. And when we got the e email saying that they had it, it was just like one by one of us, like me and Jerry and Mark and Kelly and everything, just jumping in and being like, "It's Jason's. It's Jason's. We're out of here." Um, and um, I, I like to think that everyone knows that I would like at least a shot at Miracle Man um, and also Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, oh, cool. Everyone knows over there that I will murder someone yeah. if I don't if I don't get a chance to write that. Um, and not, um, not a lot of questions about um, this one right here, man. Silver Surfer Black. Uh, what was it like working with uh, Trad Moore when you first saw? I mean, did you know going into that that uh, he was going to do what he did uh, art-wise in that book? I mean, Jesus Christ, that looked incredible. There's not a person on earth who could predict what Trad was going to do in that book. Um, honestly, I had kind of, um, I had kind of told Marvel that my dance card was full again. Like I was, I was on uh, a couple on, I was on Guardians and Venom, and I was gearing up for Thor. 
and um, uh, <clears throat> I was doing one other little thing or something like that. Um, and I kind of told them that um, I kind of wanted to step away from doing little like five issue series or like four issue series um, because they're just like a little grenade in the middle of your dead your dead deadlines, right? And then I was in um, I was in uh, Dublin, I think, um, and doing a doing a, a signing. And uh, we went out afterwards for some food, and uh, Declan Shelby was there, and uh, who's a great friend. Um, and Deck told me he was like, "Hey, uh, I don't know if you know this, but your buddy Trad is free right now and is trying to get a Silver Surfer book done at Marvel." And I was like, "Give me two seconds." <laughs> and so I called CB. And I said, CB, hey, uh, uh, Trad Moore, who, I, I, again, I went to college with Trad. Yeah, right? yeah, so I remember you staying there right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I've known Trad for a decade now, and we've always wanted to work together. Um, in fact, he was the first artist I ever approached for Ghost Fleet, and he was he was, he was was into it, but then he got his, um, uh, the Strode book got approved, and he was like, hey, man, right after I'm done with this, I'll come and do this book with you. And I was like, no, you're not. You're going you're, you're gonna to explode into a superstar. I'll never see you again. Uh, but Trad and I, and I have always uh, you know, uh, been buds, and it just lined up, and CD was way into it. And Silver Surfer Black was a really different writing experience uh, uh, for me because uh, I never turned in an outline. I never really told Marvel what it was going to be about. Um, and I never knew how it was going to end. Um, I would literally just call up Trad every month and say, hey, what do you want to draw? Uh, because who the fuck am I to tell Trad what to draw, right? right. Um, when you have someone like Trad, you got to just unleash the beast, you know? Yeah. Um, you just got to I mean get, 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 get out of his way, you know? And so, <clears throat> you know, he would call me and be like, I don't know, man. I, I I had this idea in my head where like Surfer and I don't know somebody have like a duel in their minds where like Surfer is able to turn into like dolphins and um, is like is like a is like that fight from like um, what was it called Sword the Stone where yeah. they're like turning into things. He was like, I kind of wanted to do that, and like that's all he would send me. I'd be like, well, okay, uh, let's see if I can figure that out. And so that's why you have like surfer going into the incubator chamber and and fighting with this mind fight and stuff so i would just i would just try and give him what he wanted and as it started going along ended up it ended up uh i'm 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 incredibly proud of that story um, yeah it's it's kind of a weird um pacifist like book full of hope um and love which which is that was actually something that i kind of needed to write because at the, at the time you know, I was writing Venom and uh, and and Guardians, and um, I had just written Death of the Inhumans, and so I was kind of writing a lot of stuff that was mired in despair. Uh, I was writing a lot of sad books uh, where where heroes are being punished a lot, um, and Surfer was so much fun to write because he is such an uh, a character that has like this um, this infinite compassion and this infinite hope that things will be okay um and so it was a blast man it it's was, a beautiful it was, story that is just no. so it just matches the beauty of the artwork on it like perfectly i mean it's just it's, it's, it's like you could i could just look at that and not even read the book it's gorgeous and then you read it or i could read it and not look at it i mean it's just like it's a perfect well, thanks man of beautiful writing and beautiful art shauna has a wonderful question right here she said obviously you rock mr kate's uh, how did the idea of Loki taking over the Sanctum Sanctorum come about? I don't know, man. Um, it was, <laughs> it was, okay, the God's honest truth here is that um, I, when I got assigned my first two books at Marvel, one was Thanos and one was Doctor Strange, right on the heels of each other, right? Um, and I was bound and determined to come out just guns a-blazing. You know, and um, I don't remember a lot of the outlining process. Like, I don't really, it, it all happened so fast that, like, I remember going back through my outline for both Thanos Wins and my Doctor Strange run and finding new things in there every month when I would go to, to look at it because I wrote them in like a fugue state. But really, if I'm being honest, um, I kind of had my eye on Thor uh, since I got to Marvel, and Axel Alonso, our editor in chief at the time, 
actually, when he signed me to my first exclusive, it was in hopes that my books would be successful enough and people would um, would enjoy me enough because Axel actually thought that I would be a really good fit to take over for Jason when Jason was done. And when, when the time I first signed my exclusive, Jason still had about two and a half years planned. And so Axel wanted me to be at Marvel when the time came. And it was a huge kind of gamble on his part because he signed me at, he signed my exclusive before any of my books ever came out. Hmm. Like I had only turned in scripts. So he had no idea if those books were going to be good or not, or if people were going to enjoy them or they're going to hit or anything. But I absolutely, if you look through my body of work leading up to Thor, almost every book that I do has some sort of an Asgardian element to it. Um, Cause I wanted to kind of build up to Thor and kind of put like dip my toes in the water. Yeah. And, I, and, and Loki is, and, and dude, and like, just like with Thanos, when I, when I started writing Thanos and then, like that was the same year that the film came came out. It was also the same year that Loki and Doctor Strange met on screen and like had this instant rivalry of like who was the better sorcerer. And I was seeing the audience, I was like, "What the fuck? I, that's my head. That's been in my head for the past like three years. That's that, that's, that's crazy. It was wild." That's cool, man. Uh, great legend show. Who's doing a phenomenal job over in Hall E, by the way, of uh, a mainframe Comic Con. If you haven't checked it out, go check him out. He says, uh, "What do you think of the Fantastic Four? Plain and simple." I love them uh, a lot. Um, I the, the the problem with the Fantastic Four is uh, to write them, you have to be, I think, smarter than, than I actually am. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I like you read. Uh, I actually just got done with like a big reread of Hickman's uh, FF and Future Foundation run, and I read that and I'm just like, God damn it! I'll never be that. I'll never be that smart or good, you know. Um, but yeah, I love them. I like to put them in stuff. Um, I like. Um, I like to like. I write. I've written two versions of Reed now, um, which is always fun. Evil Reed and Good Reed. E even Good Reed's got his bad uh, moments though. Um, but yeah, if you want to see more uh, um, Fantastic Four written by me, uh, you could check out the King in Black series. Um, uh, I would imagine, but I would imagine they show up in that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to talk just a little bit about Cosmic Ghost Rider. Sure. Uh, speaking of Thanos, man, I mean, what? How how good does it feel to create a character that has become such a fan favorite and probably a mainstay now in the Marvel universe forever? Uh, it's real weird, uh, yeah. considering that he was kind of supposed to be a joke. Um, he was a character that I, it was one of those same things like God Country that I just had this idea in my head for um, probably, I don't know, like five or six years before I ever wrote a Marvel comic book. Um, it started out as my tattoo artist. Um, he had this piece of flash in his tattoo studio that was just this like skeleton on like a space bike. And the skeleton had a, a helmet on. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. That could be like Ghost Rider in space. And you so, didn't give this guy any credit, did you? No, yeah, no. Ian, Ian, uh, Ian Betterman um, uh, ended up doing some covers for us and um, is involved. In, uh, he's the artist of a tomahawk. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've known Ian forever. Um, but it was that little skeleton on like a space bike that. I kind of put the seed in my head of a of a of a cosmic ghost writer, and then when I started writing Thanos, um, you know, obviously the plot of Thanos wins is that he goes and he meets his future self, right? And I needed someone to kind of be Thanos' herald, for lack of a better word, that could go back in time because you need that last page reveal of it being King Thanos. So it can't be King Thanos who comes back, and it can't be anybody in like the Black Order or anybody associated with Thanos because it would give away the reveal. And so I was looking at this blank page, and I was like, oh shit, I have that character. Um, and I, I pitched it to Jordan White at, at the time, and um, he was like, he was like, that's really cool. And I had Jeff do like a little design of it, um, and and uh, and Jordan said, "Well, who is it? Like, who is it in the in the costume?" And I was like, "Why don't you just let me turn in the outline and show it to you before I tell you? Because you're gonna like your initial reaction is gonna be that's really stupid. It doesn't make any sense. But I promise you, I can make it make sense." Yeah. Um, and so when I turned in the outline and made it Frank Castle, um, 
Jordan emailed me back and he loved it. Uh, he he liked it so much, in fact, that we had to do a deep dive to make sure that no one had ever done that before because he was like, that seems so obvious. Like, who <laughs> who likes vengeance more than Frank Castle, right? Um, it's so, funny because it does seem so obvious because, I mean, me, like probably every single person that read that Thanos book in that one page reveal where it pulls back and you see that he's been rocking this skull uh, on his yeah. armor the whole time. He's got a skull on his chest the whole time. The yeah. entire uh, fandom universe in unison just started flipping back the old pages. Like, holy shit, that was there the whole time? I yeah. didn't notice. Yeah, it was right in front of your face the entire time. Like, yeah. I felt stupid, but I know I'm not the only one. And then on uh, Thanos wins uh, the, f I think, is it the fourth issue that does his entire origin? Oh, yeah. um, and I, I remember, I, I wrote in the script like right when that opening scene of his origin ends and it cuts into like the big battle, I wrote in the script, I was like, Jordan, this is so much fun. If this works, I would really love to write us like a solo like series of this character. And Jordan wrote back like, lol, we'll see. Like, we'll, we'll see if this catches on, but like, hold on. And then it came out and it just wildly popular, just, ex just exploded. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I, I give, I give a lot of credit to Jeff Shaw and Ian for that amazing design. The character just looks cool as shit. Um, my only piece of input for the costume was, uh, um, to give him chains, um, and to give him bright red chains, uh, which then I had to go in and figure out why they were red, and I ended up doing the ground bones of of Sidorak. Um, and that came uh, from Todd McFarlane, who very famously, in a video with uh, Liefeld and Stan Lee, uh, offhandedly just said, kids love chains. <laughs> and he's right. Yeah. Kids fucking love chains. Todd chains McFarlane... Freaking rule. If Todd McFarlane tells you to do something, you should... Pay attention yeah. to that. The dude knows how to sell comics. So, uh, <laughs> so was that? Remind me. Was that was there was one issue? I think it was that origin issue where page one was just the stare. Like you open up page one and it is just Cosmic Ghost Rider just staring right at you full page. I think was that's that? issue two. That, that that's when King Thanos uh, is having his norm his 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 morning breakfast and he stares into the eyes of. That was all over my social media. As soon as I I'm, I'm sitting there in my chair, I'm drinking my cup of coffee, open it up, and I'm like. Holy shit! This is like the best way to start a comic book. I've <laughs> Thanks, ever man. Thanks, that was, dude. That was such a cool idea. Uh, Jeff crushed on that book. I mean, Jeff. Jeff really went bananas on that book too. Um, guys, do we just have a couple more minutes for questions here? Uh, uh, what's that? Raspberry Bat says, uh, "We will we still see Thanos in his lost arm and eye again?" I think you mean Thor, right? Yeah, I think you mean Thor, not Thanos, right? Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, well, here's the thing. Um, the multiverse contains a lot of possible futures, right? Uh, certainly, the end time Thor, um, or, the, or the Thor at the end of time that we saw in, at the end of Jason Aaron's run, he had one eye and one arm as well. Um, so uh, again, any, anything is possible. If you've been reading my Thor run, though, you'll you'll, you'll the um, you know it's been stated a few times that um, history and fate is being altered uh, on a on a grand scale by some unseen foe. Uh, so I would just say stay tuned on that. Yeah. Well, Donnie, we I, I wish we had more time. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up because we've got five minutes to to prep the next panel. But cannot thank you enough. I got a million more questions I'd love to ask you. Uh, but this has been great, man. A whole Absolutely, hour, dude. Damn near. We covered so much fun stuff, and we barely even scratched the surface. So hopefully, you can come back uh, on the next mainframe. We are making Absolutely. plans for something several, several, several months down the road. Uh, but this was awesome. Give our best to Megan. She's going to be appearing in Hall D yes. uh, a little later on today. She's doing the mm -hmm. uh, exclusive variants uh, yes. with a bunch of awesome variant cover people. So. Uh, Comic Core says, Donnie, thank you. Everybody's been blowing up and so awesome in the chat. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, man. Donnie, Absolutely. Uh, guys, we will be back in, oh, I'd say about five minutes with uh, Koi Jandro and uh, the deceased and uh, <laughs> the, 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 who's Tom Taylor's coming up. So, guys, we'll see you here <laughs> the, in just a little bit. I think a director's back there. So, Chad.